Coming in at number 5, SCP-054-FR. 054-FR is a phenomenon occurring in some waves off the western coasts as well as some eastern coasts. It is characterized by the physical transformation of effective waves to resemble the jaws of a great white shark. This SCP is capable of remaining unnoticed until it is almost too late to act. It is capable of forming on waves at least 4 meters tall but the maximum height of which it can reach is unknown. Effective waves are capable of rolling at 3 times the speed of non effective waves. If a non aquatic animal of a human being is situated between SCP 054 and the closest coast, appearances of this SCP are growing considerably. If the previously evoked individuals are situated at a distance of at least 250 meters from the coast, whether they are swimmers, divers, or aquatic vehicles of moderate size, with the most common victims having been surfers. Injuries caused by SCP 054 are similar to that which could be accomplished by a great white shark, but with the pressure being directly proportional to the height of the affected wave. Injuries in 68% of cases occur during the collapse of the wave over the victim. Reported injuries have been as simple as a removed limb to total disappearance of the victim. The only method of avoiding injury is to dive under the wave before impact. An exclusion zone has been established around all shorelines where an occurrence of SCP 054 FR have been observed. Only personnel with a clearance level of 3 or higher may enter the containment zones, and only for experimental purposes. Access is forbidden to any and all civilians under the pretext of conducting research on a population of marine animals. Sneaky stuff, this is why I don't go in the ocean, ever. There's something look. Coming in at number 4, SCP-3389. SCP-3389 is a man-made lake located in the northeastern United States near the town of blank Pennsylvania. Any human being entering SCP-3389 will, after a variable amount of time, not exceeding 10 minutes, be pulled beneath the surface of the water regardless of the depth at which they were standing. A few minutes after being submerged, a statue of the subject's exact likeness will rise from the water in their place. These statues are unremarkable beyond their anomalous origin, consisting of a synthetic resin and concrete mixture and given colour by standard household latex paint. Upon discovery by the foundation, there were at least 47 of these statues scattered around the lake, all in various states of decay. 13 currently remain, including that of a doctor. Doctor Blank. It is currently unknown how many instances are present prior to containment. Speaking of containment, all building private and public land in a 10 kilometer radius around SCP-3389 have been purchased by the foundation and designated provisional site 91. All roads and pedestrian pathways leading to the SCP are to be cordoned off and maintain a patrol of armed guards. An electrified chain link fence topped with barbed wire has been erected in the immediate vicinity surrounding 3389. Eight guard towers, each occupied by no less than two armed foundation personnel and equipped with security cameras, have been erected to watch over the SCP at all times. Back to the statue though, if any instances of the statues collapse, personnel stationed in the surrounding guard towers are to terminate any emerging statues instantly. No entities emerging from the lake are to reach beyond the chain link fence. If any personnel are apprehended by an instance of SCP-3389, every attempt is to be made to terminate them before they can be pulled into the water. Coming in at number 3, SCP-4217. 4217 refers to both the Bismarck, an anomalous German battleship sunk in 1941, and the large cephalopod organism that is fused to the inside of its hull. SCP-4217-B possesses a pair of octopoid eyes which protrude from the base of SCP-4217-A's superstructure and 12 100 to 200 meter long muscular hydrostats that extend from an opening in the stern. Now aside from the presence of SCP-4217-B, SCP-4217-A shows no signs whatsoever of damage sustained from battle or subsequent decades submerged underwater. B seemingly operates A's systems. This includes its full armament of 8 main guns, 44 seconds guns and 12 anti-aircraft guns. B also can operate A's propellers to reach speeds approaching 40 knots, but only while surfaced. This is way too much power for a creature to have and could be incredibly detrimental if you piss it off. While submerged, SCP-4217 achieves locomotion via ejection of water from B's body cavity. Typically, this SCP remains submerged at a depth of 500 to 1100 meters, navigating its territory. However, the SCP will periodically surface and enter a hostile state 
state. During this period, it will seek and attack non-threatening targets. Now Foundation naval forces are to patrol the SCP's territory with three or more battleships under the guise of the British Royal Navy. During a hostile state, naval forces are to engage with the SCP until it reverts to a passive state. Survivors from civilian vessels attacked by the SCP are to be recovered and processed in accordance with maritime disinformation protocols. Coming in at number 2 SCP-1128 SCP-1128 is an entity that manifests as a massive aquatic predator to anyone given a full description of the beings appearance through the spoken, written descriptions or visual depictions of the being. Persons infected by SCP-1128 will initially exhibit no abnormal behaviour, though some cases show a general aversion to activities involving bodily immersion in water such as bathing or swimming. Should subjects become fully immersed in water, they will disappear completely under the surface of the water regardless of the water's actual depth. In most cases, they will reappear moments later in a panic state and frantically try to leave the water. However, in other cases, the water will become polluted with blood and debris, confirmed to be the remains of the subject. That sucks. The subjects that reappear intact claim that they were transported to a vast ocean where they were pursued by SCP-1128. Interviews with the surviving subjects carry further contamination as descriptions of the being's appearance trigger further infections. Yikes. Written description or imagery of the SCP's appearance or videos of the entity breaching found outside of the foundation are to be destroyed. And Class C amnestics are to be administered to anyone exposed to such information or showing signs of the SCP's contamination. A written description of the entity's appearance is to be kept at sight blank for experimental purposes only and is not to be read by anyone other than D class used for testing. If exposed, staff are to report immediately for administration of class C amnestics. And finally, coming in at number one, SCP 3000. SCP 3000 is a massive aquatic serpentine entity strongly resembling a giant moray eel. The exact length of 3000 is impossible to determine, however, it is believed to be somewhere around 600 and 900 kilometers, with the head of SCP 3000 measuring roughly 2.5 meters in diameter and sections of the body proper being around 10 meters in diameter. Yeah, horrifying. Now 3000 is typically a sedentary creature only moving its head in response to certain stimuli or during feeding. The majority of its body is located around the Ganges fan and rarely moves at all. SCP-3000 is carnivorous and despite its sedentary nature is capable of moving quickly to dispatch prey, aka us if we were ever to encounter it. Despite its size, it is believed that SCP-3000 does not require sustenance to maintain its biological functions, okay, it kills for the hell of it. When 3000 consumes prey, a thin layer of viscous, dark grey substance classified as Y909 is excreted from its skin, with the end result of its digestive processes currently unknown. In some historical records, Dr Eugene Getz reports on SCP-3000, I quote, The unease was felt throughout the entire crew as we descended on that first night. Whether this was due to our uncertainty at what we would discover, or something more sinister, I would not speculate. At around 0940 hours, we first observed the head of the entity. The unease was palpable now. Several other crew members complained of feeling hazy and of being uncertain what they were supposed to be doing. When we were within 50 meters, the entity turned slowly to look at us. Even now, as I recall watching this thing coil around in the darkness, I can still hear Williams barking like a mad dog in the rear of the vessel, screaming and flailing, shouting about how he could see it in his head. Frightening stuff. The the area containing SCP-3000, currently a region of the Bay of Bagal, roughly 300 kilometers in diameter, is to be routinely patrolled by Foundation naval vessels. Under no circumstances are civilians allowed to attempt deep sea exploration or diving efforts in the quarantined area. Individuals believed to have contacted SCP-3000 are to be contained, quarantined and processed at Site 151. Sadly, there is currently no known cure for exposure to 3000. As such, such affected individuals should be contained and quarantined for further evaluation. Awful. Coming in at number 5, SCP-3700. 3700 is the designation for a circular area in the North Sea with a diameter of 800 kilometers, encompassing the archipelagos of Faroe. I hope I'm saying that correctly. 
Orkney and Shetland. It has an abnormal depth with the seafloor located 5 kilometers below the ocean surface compared to an average 250 to 300 meters for the rest of the North Sea. This SCP is subject to a wide and varied array of anomalous occurrences due to ritualistic interactions between two entities which have been designated SCP-3701 and SCP-3702. Effects of SCP-3701 are entirely dependent on which entity successfully subdues the other during each ritual. All rituals with the exception of two consistent dates take place at random periods of time. SCP-3701 and 2 always interact on dates corresponding with the spring and fall equinox of the given year. Now the specific interactions between 1 and 2 consist of prolonged struggle where each entity will attempt to temporarily kill or subdue the other. Interactions on equinox dates are usually short and can occur in random locations, with the victor of the previous interactions quickly dispatching the other entity. Now here's where things get really, really interesting. Successful defeat of one entity by the other induces a number of different geological and meteorological changes within the 800 km zone. When SCP-3701 subdues 2, storms and harsh weather are immediately dispelled. Reproductive rates of local oceanic and island fauna increase by a factor of 3. Erosion rates increase by a factor of 5. When SCP-3702 subdues 1, meteorological conditions become perilous, continuous storms raging in strength from category 1 to 5 hurricanes occur. Travel by sea is near impossible. Ocean food sources are driven from the area due to the extreme condition. Yikes, pretty rough. As of right now, Foundation Naval Task Force Delta 7 is currently assigned to patrol the area. Coming in at number 4, SCP-835. 835 appears to be a large mass of coral like polyps weighing an unknown amount. The polyps are larger than any known coral species, growing to more than 1 meter in diameter in some cases. The central mass is roughly oval shaped with a very large polyp at each end. This SCP is incapable of locomotion and appears to anchor itself with the large tentacles projected from the SCP 835 polyps. Now, these are also used in feeding and are coated with a sticky adhesive substance. The tentacles are also quite strong and have been shown to be capable of damaging plate steel. That's pretty scary. The coral itself is extremely hard, requiring high powered diamond drills to collect even small samples. 835 also grows at a very accelerated rate, capable of adding 50 pounds of mass every single day. Not just that, but it is also susceptible to many chemicals, which in turn causes 835 to seal up and halt all growth for 24 hours, prompting development and use of suppression tactic AA6. It is also known to emit a large mass of liquidy material several times a day from the large polyps on each end. This appears to be made of semi-digested solids, fecal material and semen. <laughs> Absolutely disgusting. As of right now, 835 is to be monitored and checked daily for new growth. In the event 835 becomes hostile, suppression tactic AA6 is to be immediately implemented until aggressive action ceases. The containment area must be maintained in open ocean due to the highly aggressive response of 835 to confinement for any length of time. Coming in at number 3, SCP-3934. 3934 is a species of amphibious reptiles produced via anomalous means by Marshall Carter and Dark LLP. Essentially, this SCP is the Loch Ness Monster. Kinda. Instances of 3934, classified as Plesiosaurus pygmius, grow to only just over half the size of other plesiosaurs, with adult males average 1.9 meters in length and adult females averaging 1.7 meters. These specimens are omnivorous and subsist on a diet of fish and aquatic flora. Now, 3934 were originally created in the early 20th century by MC and D with the intent to sell instances as exotic pets or aquarium denizens. MC and D capitalized on the legend's popularity to sell specimens to numerous wealthy individuals of noble or industrial background in both Europe and the United States. Between 1935 and present, an estimated 1200 to 1400 
SCP-3934 instances have been created and sold. They are said to be highly social animals, both with members of their own species and with humans. Now, although they are generally friendly, abandoned instances of 3934 often react with uncharacteristic violence towards humans and other mammals. As of right now, a part of 59 SCP-3934 instances is currently contained within Site 220's Parazoology Reserve. Coming in at 2, SCP-2846 SCP-2846 is a massive aquatic octopoid entity, currently estimated to be at least 955 to 990 meters in length. It collectively refers to a set of phenomenon occurring within the Gulf Atlantic region of the Atlantic Ocean. This entity is known to appear from deep water during storms within the Gulf Atlantic region and attack civilian vessels, specifically cruise liners or merchant ships. Now, now, 2846A's attacks are sporadic and often occur quickly and without prior warning. Foundation assets in the region have utilized United States Navy deep sea radar wells to more accurately detect the appearance of SCP 2846A, though this has only provided, on average, an additional five minutes of preparation. Now, SCP 2846B is a large seafaring vessel that appears during A's appearance events. This vessel, which appears to be Pennsylvania class. Super Dreadnought Battleship also appears from deep water before surfacing at the location of an SCP 2846A appearance event. A is believed to be an entity that has existed for potentially thousands of years, although information confirming this is scarce. Mobile Task Force Tau QQ on board the SCP's Nikolai are to maintain a perimeter around active 2846 activation areas. In the event of an SCP 2846A appearance event, MTF T11 is to utilize the Kensington Barrymen high power transmitting device to communicate with SCP 2846B and then to maintain contact contact with B throughout the engagement. And finally coming in at number 1, SCP-1451. 1451 is a set of metal statues, 26 in total, which are individually referred to as SCP-1451. 1 through 26, which all appear to be of children with heights ranging from 1.32 meters to 1.43 meters. 1451 can be in three distinct states of motion, referred to as class 1 to 3 scenarios. During a class 1 scenario, no movement is detected. This state is the most ideal for containment. During both class 1 and class 2 scenarios, SCP-1451 are standing in a circle, each one grasping the hands of the statues adjacent to them and facing outwards. During a class 2 scenario, 1451 will animate slightly, shifting themselves with the apparent goal of counterclockwise locomotion. The hands on SCP-1451 will also raise and lower slightly during these moments. Bubbles can also be seen emanating from the mouths as well. Now this state must be closely monitored as it can very quickly transition into class 3 scenario. When a solid object with a mass greater than 40g enters the center of the circle, 1451 will animate and attempt to destroy said object. This is class 3. 1451 has shown remarkable strength and agility in the past, so the extent of these qualities has not been found. As of right now, 1451 is contained in area 15 and is surrounded by a sphere of wire mesh to ensure that no large objects can enter the containment, aka humans who could potentially potentially meet their end. Access is denied to all persons attempting to enter regardless of rank. Coming in at number 5, Cthulhu. Cthulhu is a great old one of great power that lies in a depth like slumber beneath the Pacific Ocean in his sunken city of Rillier. To quote H.P. Lovecraft himself, that is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. The most detailed description of this hulking cosmic monster comes to us from the call of Cthulhu, as well as statues of the creature constructed by an artist after a series of baleful dreams, is to have, I quote, yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings. In The Call of Cthulhu, H.P. Lovecraft states that Cthulhu represents a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, prodigious claws on hind and four feet, and long, narrow wings behind. Cast 
Castro, a Cthulhu cultist, reports that the Great Old Ones are telepathic and knew all that was occurring in the universe. They were able to communicate with the first humans by moulding their dreams, thus establishing the Cthulhu cult. But after Aurelia had sunk beneath the waves, I quote, the deep waters full of one primal mystery through which not even thought can pass had cut off the spectral intercourse. To quote H.P. Lovecraft's work at the Mountain of Madness, with the upheaval of new land in the South Pacific, tremendous events began. Another race, a land race of beings shaped like octopi and properly corresponding to the fabulous pre-human spawn of Cthulhu, soon began filtering down from cosmic infinity and precipitated a monstrous war which for time drove the old ones wholly back to the sea. Later peace was made and the new lands were given to the Cthulhu spawn whilst the old ones held the sea and the other lands. The Antarctic remained the centre of the old ones civilization, and all the discoverable cities built there by the Cthulhu spawn were blotted out. Then suddenly the lands of the Pacific sank again, taking with them the frightful stone city of Rillier and all the cosmic octopi, so that the old ones were once again supreme on the planet. A lot to consume, I know, and perhaps I'm slightly cheating with Cthulhu considering he is a land monster swallowed into the seas, but I did it and I'm glad. Don't fight me on this. You will lose. Coming in at number four, Chul. Chul are cosmic monsters that hail from the world of dungeons and dragons. The Chul can breathe air and water and can sense magic within 120 feet of it at will. I quote, I fought a Chul once. My sword bounced right off its carapace. It still has that sword and the arm I swung it with. They were large lobster-like aberrations with hatred for surface dwelling humanoids. The many tentacles that surround in their mouths were capable of causing paralysis with a single touch, thus leaving their unfortunate victim at the mercy of the Chul's powerful claws. Amphibious by nature, the Chul's were actually not great swimmers at the beginning, preferring to engage in combat either on land or very shallow water. They would often wait by a shoreline, while submerged or partially submerged in murky water, until it heard a suitable prey item, either within or without the water that it could perform a surprise attack upon. They were incredibly strong combatants, choosing to fight by grabbing and piercing their target with their enormous claws. Claws. Much like a number of other deadly cosmic monsters, Chul's had psychic abilities. However, it was unusual for a young Chul to have access to such powers. Instead, they would gradually become able to exude psychic static as they aged. Older and larger creatures were able to emit a psychic moan that weakened resistance to psychic attacks and use a psychic lure to draw victims towards it. That's a lot of psychics. All in all, these dudes were deadly and were not to be messed with. And also, they're just downright terrifying to look at. Coming in at three, Mother. Hydra. Mother Hydra is yet another cosmic monster hailing from the mind of HP Lovecraft. It is a creature who, alongside her consort Father Dagon, is said to rule over the race commonly referred to as the Deep Ones. There has been a debate throughout time as to whether or not Mother Hydra is a lesser Great Old One or merely a grotesquely mutated Deep One, though the latter seems more likely as she doesn't seem to show much in the way of supernatural power. That is, outside of her gigantic size and long lifespan. Mother Hydra was also also one of the Wilmar Foundation's targets during Project X in March of 1980. The operation was ultimately unsuccessful and she was able to escape the partial destruction of the Deep One city outside Innsmouth Harbour, along with Father Dagon and Cathilla. Coming in at number two, Father Dagon, also known as Dagon, is yet another creature which appears in the HP Lovecraft inspired Cthulhu mythos. Father Dagon is a horrifically looking humanoid over 50 feet tall and resembles an enormously oversized deep one with a fish like face, flapping gills, and a scaled, slimy height. There is much debate over whether Dagon is a true great old one or simply a deep one grown to colossal proportions, as some deep ones continue to grow in size over the course of their life. Along with his consort, Mother Hydra, and great Cthulhu, Dagon is a member of the Deep One's Holy Trinity, the trio of beings worshipped as gods by the oceanic species. Not only that, but Cthulhu also entrusted the guardianship of his daughter Cthulhu to Dagon and Mother Hydra, and the pair are thought to hold watch over her in one of their great underwater cities somewhere in the North Atlantic. In addition to their following of Deep Ones, Dagon and Hydra are also worshipped by a cult of humans and human Deep One hybrids known as the Historic Order of Dagon. Like our last number, Dagon was one of the targets of the Wilmer Foundation's Project X in the early 1980s. The objective of the operation was to annihilate Father Dagon, Mother Hydra, and Cthulhu, but it was unsuccessful and the three escaped safely. And finally coming in at number one, Drowner of Hope. 
The Drowner of Hope is an Eldrazi, an ancient race native to the blind eternities that have neither physical form nor colour alignment. Their nature is ceaseless hunger, so they travel between planes, devouring the mana and life energy until the plane's destruction. Though each lineage has a distinct anatomy, each one of them seems to have commonality. A probusk is located somewhere near a joint acts as a feeding tube, attaching to a subject and draining them of life. Eldrazi proper and their infant spawns have no colour alignment and the mere presence of larger Eldrazi can cause reality to dissipate. However, Eldrazi drones born to serve the larger base species are often aligned. Now, What makes this race interesting is that they are genderless, lacking apparent biological sex and display no awareness of the concept of gender. They are also known to follow ley lines to move on a plane's surface. Now, The Drowner of Hope was specifically created for the oceans and like I said, drains life from everything it touches. It doesn't get more terrifying than that. Coming in at number 5, SCP-3700. 3700 is the designation for a circular area in the North Sea with a diameter of 800 kilometers, encompassing the archipelagos of Faroe. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Orkney and Shetland. It has an abnormal depth, with the seafloor located 5 kilometers below the ocean surface compared to an average 250 to 300 meters for the rest of the North Sea. This SCP is subject to a wide and varied array of anomalous occurrences due to ritualistic interactions between two entities, which have been designated SCP-3701 and SCP-3702. Effects of SCP-3700 are entirely dependent on which entity successfully subdues the other during each ritual. All rituals, with the exception of two consistent dates, take place at random periods of time. SCP-3701 and 2 always interact on dates corresponding with the spring and fall equinox of the given year. Now, The specific interactions between 1 and 2 consist of prolonged struggle where each entity will attempt to temporarily kill or subdue the other. Interactions on equinox dates are usually short and can occur in random locations, with the victor of the previous interactions quickly dispatching the other entity. Now here's where things get really, really interesting. Successful defeat of one entity by the other induces a number of different geological and meteorological changes within the 800 km zone. When SCP-3701 subdues two, storms and harsh weather are immediately dispelled. Reproductive rates of local oceanic and island fauna increase by a factor of 3. Erosion rates increase by a factor of 5. When SCP-3702 subdues 1, meteorological conditions become perilous. Continuous storms ranging in strength from category 1 to 5 hurricanes occur. Travel by sea is near impossible. Ocean food sources are driven from the area due to the extreme condition. Yikes, pretty rough. As of right now, Foundation Naval Task Force Delta 7 is currently assigned to patrol the area. Coming in at number 4, SCP-835. 835 appears to be a large mass of coral like polyps weighing an unknown amount. The polyps are larger than any known coral species, growing to more than 1 meter in diameter in some cases. The central mass is roughly oval shaped with a very large polyp at each end. This SCP is incapable of locomotion and appears to anchor itself with the large tentacles projected from the SCP 835 polyps. Now, these are also used in feeding and are coated with a sticky adhesive substance. The tentacles are also quite strong and have been shown to be capable of damaging plate steel. That's pretty scary. The coral itself is extremely hard, requiring high powered diamond drills to collect even small samples. 835 also grows at a very accelerated rate, capable of adding 50 pounds of mass every single day. Not just that, but it is also susceptible to many chemicals, which in turn causes 835 to seal up and halt all growth for 24 hours, prompting development and use of suppression tactic AA6. It is also known to emit a large mass of liquidy material several times a day from the large polyps on each end. This appears to be made of semi-digested solids, fecal material and semen. <laughs> Absolutely disgusting. As of right now, 835 is to be monitored and checked daily for new growth. In the event 835 becomes hostile, suppression tactic AA6 is to be immediately implemented until aggressive action ceases. The containment area must be maintained in open ocean due to the highly aggressive response of 835 to confinement for any length of time. Coming in at number 3, SCP-3934. 
3934 is a species of amphibious reptiles produced via anomalous means by Marshall Carter and Dark LLP. Essentially, this SCP is the Loch Ness Monster. Kinda. Instances of 3934, classified as Plesiosaurus pygmius, grow to only just over half the size of other plesiosaurs, with adult males average 1.9 meters in length and adult females averaging 1.7 meters. These specimens are omnivorous and subsist on a diet of fish and aquatic flora. Now, 3934 were originally created in the early 20th century by MC and D with the intent to sell instances as exotic pets or aquarium denizens. MC and D capitalized on the legend's popularity to sell specimens to numerous wealthy individuals of noble or industrial background in both Europe and the United States. Between 1935 and present, an estimated 1200 to 1400 SCP-3934 instances have been created and sold. They are said to be highly social animals, both with members of their own species and with humans. Now, Although they are generally friendly, abandoned instances of 3934 often react with uncharacteristic violence towards humans and other mammals. As of right now, a part of 59 SCP-3934 instances is currently contained within Site-220's Parazoology Reserve. Coming in at 2, SCP-2846. SCP-2846 is a massive aquatic octopoid entity, currently estimated to be at least 955 to 990 meters in length. It collectively refers to a set of phenomena occurring within the Gulf Atlantic region of the Atlantic Ocean. This entity is known to appear from deep water during storms within the Gulf Atlantic region and attack civilian vessels, specifically cruise liners or merchant ships. Now, now, 2846A's attacks are sporadic and often occur quickly and without prior warning. Foundation assets in the region have utilized United States Navy deep sea radar wells to more accurately detect the appearance of SCP 2846A, though this has only provided, on average, an additional five minutes of preparation. Now, SCP 2846B is a large seafaring vessel that appears during A's appearance events. This vessel, which appears to be Pennsylvania class. Super Dreadnought Battleship also appears from deep water before surfacing at the location of an SCP 2846A appearance event. A is believed to be an entity that has existed for potentially thousands of years, although information confirming this is scarce. Mobile Task Force Tau QQ on board the SCP's Nikolai are to maintain a perimeter around active 2846 activation areas. In the event of an SCP 2846A appearance event, MTF T11 is to utilize the Kensington Barryman high power transmitting device to communicate with SCP 2846B and then to maintain contact contact with B throughout the engagement. And finally coming in at number 1, SCP-1451. 1451 is a set of metal statues, 26 in total, which are individually referred to as SCP-1451, 1 through 26, which all appear to be of children with heights ranging from 1.32 meters to 1.43 meters. 1451 can be in three distinct states of motion, referred to as class 1 to 3 scenarios. During a class 1 scenario, no movement is detected. This state is the most ideal for containment. During both class 1 and class 2 scenarios, SCP 1451 are standing in a circle, each one grasping the hands of the statues adjacent to them and facing outwards. During a in class 2 scenario, 1451 will animate slightly, shifting themselves with the apparent goal of counterclockwise locomotion. The hands on SCP-1451 will also raise and lower slightly during these moments. Bubbles can also be seen emanating from the mouths as well. Now, This state must be closely monitored as it can very quickly transition into class 3 scenario. When a solid object with a mass greater than 40g enters the center of the circle, 1451 will animate and attempt to destroy said object. This is class 3. 1451 has shown remarkable strength and agility in the past, so the extent of these qualities has not been found. As of right now, 1451 is contained in area 15 and is surrounded by a sphere of wire mesh to ensure that no large objects can enter the containment, aka humans who could potentially potentially meet their end. Access is denied to all persons attempting to enter regardless of rank. Coming in at number 5, we've got Deep Blue Sharks. You could make an argument that these are just normal sharks, but that argument would be wrong. It would be like saying that the shark from Jaws was just a regular shark. And not even Bruce had the brain capacity to take down an entire aquatic research facility. 
let's take a look. The 1999 Shark Attack thriller Deep Blue Sea was met with mixed reviews, largely due to its heavy use of B-movie plot points. Don't get me wrong, B-movie plot points make the world go round, but listen to this. In Deep Blue Sea, there's a research team trying to find a way to reactivate brain cells affected by Alzheimer's disease. For whatever reason, the scientists landed on using Mako sharks. What makes a shark brain special? Who knows? So these Alzheimer's sharks are hanging out in some holding tanks, having brain tissue removed and so on. Then one wakes up, bites a man's arm off, and then yanks a helicopter out of the air. Huh. As it turns out, these scientists have genetically modified these sharks to have bigger brains in order to ensure they can harvest enough gray matter to do their research. And these bigger brains have enabled the dead-eyed predators to become smarter and more deadly than ever. How do they even manage that? You can just make brains bigger now? Imagine that, making a shark so smart that it could take your place in the food chain. Incredible stuff. Following this reveal, these sharks are nothing but bad news. They kill plenty of people, all while sabotaging control panels, cutting off exits, and generally making a big mess of the research facility. Those big brains really get put to work. So if you didn't already have this recurring nightmare, you can now add brainy fish to your laundry list of fears. Coming in at number four, we've got Umibozu. We'll take a quick break from movie monsters for a moment and examine a terrifying mythological monster. This sea spirit is included in the ever interesting category of Japanese creatures known as yokai. It will appear when waters are at their calmest and absolutely wreck ships. Isn't that just cruel? When the going is easy, it decides to provide its own type of storm. They appear to be large black humanoid figures. Different sizes have been sighted, but they're often tens of meters tall. Legends may vary by location, but a common story is that of an umibozu rising from the water and demanding a bucket or barrel from the sailors. If you hand it one of these containers, it will then drown you. It's been said that the only way to escape one, if it doesn't wreck your ship immediately, is to hand it a bottomless barrel and sail away when it's confused. Many people believe that umibozu sightings are simply the result of seafaring folk incorrectly seeing other naturally occurring phenomena. It could very well be clouds or other large sea organisms. Still, you don't want to take any chances with giant paranormal monsters. The origins of the umibozu are murky at best, and there are no stories that clearly depict its creation or first appearance. However, some say that they are the spirits of dead priests that were tossed into the waters. Their bodies have nowhere to rest, so their souls haunt the ocean, dooming anyone who crosses them. Sheesh. Coming in at number three, we've got Gilman, also known as the creature from the Black Lagoon. It's hard to look at this classic creature nowadays without conjuring up the many, many other beasts that paid homage. Swamp Thing, Davy Jones' crew, and of course, the amphibian man from The Shape of Water. Hollywood was shaped by this slimy, girl-chasing man-beast. Sure, it seems campy and done to death at this point, but way back when, it was a thrilling icon. After discovering a fossil linking land and sea animals, a team of researchers decide to stick around in the Amazon to find more. When the leader leaves camp, Gilman appears. Green and greasy and curious as a child, he infiltrates the camp and kills two expedition members in self-defense. And thus begins a strange game of cat and mouse, or researcher and monster and beautiful woman. Gilman has the ability to overpower just about any human in a fight, to swim at unheard of speeds, and of course to breathe underwater. All of this combined with a lust for human female makes him a terrible beast indeed. Sure, it can be argued that Gilman is just misunderstood, an idea that Guillermo del Toro would later explore in more detail, but for the average moviegoer and upholder of the status quo, it was a terrifying beast indeed. The rubber suit may be cheesy, but it's stuck in the collective minds of theater attendees around the world. Coming in at number two, we've got The Host. Before Parasite, Bong Joon-ho was still putting out movie after masterful movie. In some way or another, they were all about monsters too. Memories of Murder was about a boogeyman, Snowpiercer was about men who would exploit all sorts of people to keep a semblance of order, Okja was about the ever ravenous food industry. But looking at the host, it's a movie about a literal monster, and that's pretty much it. There's plenty of commentary about other things in the world, like how the powers that be can be straight up evil, and about how war can have lingering effects long after conflict ends, and also about how the youngest and weakest of us need to be protected. But in the end, The Host is just a crazy monster movie, and the monster is awesome. Apparently it was based on Steve Buscemi too. Who would've thunk? This slimy, bipedal, prehensile, tailed beast runs throughout urban Korea, swallowing people whole and disappearing into the water like it's nothing. People unload entire magazines of bullets into it, shoot at it with sporting bows, toss molotovs, and even unleash terrifying chemical agents, and it still runs around eating children. It's a freaky, straightforward monster with a million slippery folds making up its mouth. And at any given moment, it might regurgitate any number of things. Even if the 2006 era digital effects don't quite hold up, it's still fascinating to look at. And finally, at number one, we've got Godzilla. 
Come on, you didn't think I'd leave the granddaddy of all kaiju off this list, did ya? Walking straight up out of the ocean to level entire cities, Godzilla is the archetypal aquatic monster. The roar, iconic. The silhouette, iconic. The destruction, iconic. Without Godzilla, we wouldn't have any other kaiju either. Say bye bye to the ocean spawning beasts from Pacific Rim. Sayonara to all the crazy monsters the Super Sentai and Power Rangers fight. Bye bye to the clover fields, gamoras, and mega sharks. Godzilla is the aquatic monster. A prehistoric sea creature given power by nuclear radiation, this upright reptilian is a force to be reckoned with. Described by a doctor in the original film as a transitional creature somewhere between marine and terrestrial, there's nowhere to hide from Godzilla. It's taken many forms over the years, but retains most of its classic features. The furrowed brow, rough scales, long tail, and enormous legs. Sometimes it even takes a while to evolve to that point, like in Shin Godzilla. It has atomic breath, which it uses to vaporize anything it wants. Different iterations feature magnetism, fireballs, laser beams, flying, and electric bites too. So if you're ready for one form of Godzilla, there's dozens more waiting in the wings to test the populace in new, destructive ways. King of the monsters, right? Who wants to go for a swim? Nobody? Huh. I guess all this talk of aquatic monster madness has made taking a dip a little less appealing, eh? My bad. Coming at number five, we've got The Meg from The Meg. Sometimes I wonder how many shark movies actually exist and my brain overheats. Like ever since Jaws, there's been an obsession with gigantic sharp toothed fish flying through the water and eviscerating people. Sometimes they jump way out of the water, other times they manage to sneakily chew a limb or two off a swimmer. Hell, there's even been instances of them finding their way into a tornado or two. But the most recent big shark flick took the idea and supersized it, like quite literally too. While it might not be a horror movie by strict standards, it definitely delivers on the terrifying aquatic monster. This movie is all about a team of scientists who come across a whopping 75 foot long megalodon shark. That is the titular Meg. Could you imagine ever seeing a predator that was 75 feet long, especially in the dark murky depths of the ocean? Well, here's the thing. 75 feet is just the beginning. Spoilers for anyone who's really invested in this shark movie that came out two years ago. So after all sorts of crazy underwater antics, the crew manages to snag the Meg. They caught the thought to be extinct Mega Shark. Rejoice! But hold on, it's way too early for the shark to be done so. We're only like an hour into the movie. Well, if you thought there had to be more, you'd be right. While celebrating their catch, the crew witnesses something truly awe-inspiring. Another, bigger megalodon shark speeds its way onto the scene and eats the first one. After instilling a sense of awe in the audience early on with the original giant shark, they decide to blow those expectations out of the water with an even more enormous aquatic monster. Just awesome. Say what you will about the movie as a whole, there is nothing cool than a giant shark getting devoured by an even gianter shark. Coming at number four, we've got Piranhas from Piranha 3D. For another journey into the land of absurdly sized fish, let's take a look at Piranha 3D. This is B-movie schlock at its peak. An earthquake opens up a chasm at the bottom of a lake, releasing thousands of ancient carnivorous fish just in time for spring break and they are hungry. They've been surviving via cannibalism for the two million years they've been assumed to be extinct, and they are ready for some fresh meat. Fresh human meat. These things are vicious. They tear people apart in seconds, leaving goofy little bloody skeletons behind. It's a sight to behold for sure. I guess spending millions of years in an underground cavern void of light full of the remains of the brethren you just consume makes you aggressive or something. Isn't that the backstory of the monsters in the descent? I'm getting off track here. Most movies use the anticipation of the monster to really sell the scares, but not Piranha 3D. These things go full tilt from the very beginning. They rise from the bottom of the lake and don't stop eating until the very end. And really, at the very end, they're still eating. Sure, the kills start small, but they grow by orders of magnitude. We open on a lone man being devoured, then we get a fishing boat, then some scuba divers bite the big one in the sky. Of course, the bit that everyone remembers is when the piranhas plow through a beach party. Thousands of lives extinguished. Just like that. Whirlpools of piranhas tear people apart with seemingly zero effort, followed by fish jumping out of the water to get at all the landlubbers. And the best part? Piranha did the bigger, badder thing before the Meg. That's right. The piranhas that take out an entire crop of spring breakers are actually babies. They're immature, only a fraction of the size of a full grown one. Then as the movie ends, we catch a glimpse of a full-size piranha, bigger than a grown man. And there's more on the way. 
I love bee movies. Coming at number three, we've got the bioluminescent creature from Sea Fever. Our first two movies reveled in the bombastic, so let's slow it down for a second. Sea Fever is slow and suffocating in its application of aquatic terror. It really takes its time getting under your skin, but boy, when the fear strikes, it strikes big. It's one of those movies where you're never quite sure if what you think is happening is actually happening, but plenty of clues keep the tension high. Siobhan, a reclusive scientist, finds herself on an Irish fishing trawler heading out to sea. The captain steers the ship towards an exclusion zone, knowing that there are plenty of fish out there, even if it's off limits. He doesn't tell the rest of the crew though, leaving them to assume that their big catch was just lucky and outside of the exclusion zone. The exclusion zone was erected for good reason though, as the folks aboard soon find out. During their journey, something stops their boat. Goopy, slimy breaches appear in the hull, and whatever's causing them continues to hold the boat in place. Thinking it's a shoal or something similar, Siobhan hops off the side to do a research dive and discovers the culprit, glowing tentacles originating from a gigantic organism way down below. It is so vast that she cannot see the full form of it from where she is. After their encounter with these strange tendrils, the boat is freed and off they go. But that's just the beginning. See, the big creature manages to infect a crewmate by cutting his hand, injecting larva into his bloodstream. He starts acting weird, and at first the captain chalks it up to sea fever, you know, when you're stuck on a boat, you start going a little crazy. Too late though, because this guy's eyes explode out of his head, and the more mature larva make it into the ship's water supply. Anyone could be infected at that point. The bioluminescent creature manages to be incredibly scary while also somewhat sympathetic. It's just an unknown animal doing its best to survive as animals do. They shouldn't have been in the exclusion zone anyway. Although the monster isn't really a virus, sea fever manages to be extremely painfully prescient, as folks want to leave quarantine to get help, without considering that they could cause so many more problems in doing so. Coming in at number two, we've got the creatures from the beach house. Now if you really want to get Lovecrafty in with your aquatic monsters, you gotta head down to the beach house. If an aquatic creature is bioluminescent, it probably means that we as humans were never meant to see it. They come from the deep, deep depths, and encountering anything like that is probably the result of hubris. In the beach house, a young couple heads down to a beach house for some time off. They find that a couple of family friends are there all ready to have one last vacation before a terminal illness takes hold of the wife. After eating some edibles, everyone has a weird experience involving water quality, fog, glowing stuff, and more. These oddities are assumed to be side effects of the consuming of marijuana, so nobody thinks too much about it. The morning after has a different story to tell though. The beach is empty, save for some strange jellyfish, and everyone seems to have sustained odd injuries. The older couple, Mitch and Jane, are acting very strange with Mitch walking into the water and not returning, and Jane remaining in a catatonic state. Soon it becomes apparent that something is very wrong with the jellyfish seeming to infect people, turning them into flesh-hungry zombies. They send little bugs skittering and slithering into people's open wounds, and if you don't rip them out quick enough, you'll end up as a milky-eyed automaton. In addition to the jellyfish and bugs, there's also an infectious fog that will do similar things to people's minds and bodies. Not ideal. Whatever these beings are, they've fundamentally changed life on Earth in the Beach House's world. If you're a fan of the color out of space, you'll appreciate this one. And finally at number one, we've got Bruce from Jaws. Easy number one pick, right? You can't go wrong with this shark infested classic. Jaws set the standard for every shark movie to follow and hasn't ever been matched. Not to mention that it literally birthed the blockbuster. Plus it scared people out of swimming, boating, and in some cases bathing for ages. It inspired folks to get out on the water and kill sharks for sport, which led to some terrible problems with the shark population. That's how much sway it had. The influence this aquatic monster had on the hearts and minds of people is insane to say the least. In addition to branding the image of a gigantic horrible shark into the brains of every man, woman, and child, it also managed to be very restrained with its implementation of the underwater apex predator. Sure, it was probably thanks to plenty of malfunctions in the shark animatronic, but rarely actually seeing the shark really ups the white knuckle tension. That and the iconic strings. To this day, people know exactly what you're talking about if you sing dun dun Dun, 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 dun. People who haven't seen Jaws know that that means a shark is coming. Phenomenal stuff. Plus, Jaws stays socially relevant. Consider the implications of closing down the beach and therefore business on Amity Island versus what's happening as a result of this pandemic. It might seem like I'm reaching, but the comparison stands. Jaws will never get stale. Good thing winter's coming, that'll keep you away from the water for a little while. No swimming means no shark attacks, right? Or unknown glowing monster attacks, or piranha attacks. You get what I'm trying to say. Coming in at number five, we've got Grabbers from Grabbers. <laughs> Their 
should be a more scientific name for these brutes, but I haven't heard an accurate description yet. Well, not more accurate than grabbers, anyways. They're weird, fleshy masses of tentacles and blood-sucking tongues who kill whatever they can get their tendrils on. At first, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. They take down a bunch of whales and lay some eggs in the sand, but they only subsist on blood and water, so there's no way they could make it on land and kill a bunch of folks, right? Well, unless they show up on a remote, rainy Irish island, and then they can flop around to their greasy little heart's content, now couldn't they? Uh-oh. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, from little floppy baby ones that might end up attached to like an oversized leech, to mid-sized mama ones who could hypothetically drain all the blood from you after grabbing your head, to gigantic, truck-sized, swirling balls of limbs who can tear vehicles apart and swallow people whole. Yeesh. And they're rolling out of the water? That's bad news. The one saving grace is that they're so purely dependent on blood and water that alcohol can really mess them up. Feeding them booze straight up is a bit of a challenge though, considering they're extremely aggressive predators, but there's a workaround. If your blood alcohol level is high enough, they won't want to drink it. And if they do, they'll get knocked the fuck out. Classic. I always knew drinking in excess would save my life someday. These rules don't apply to other horror movies, unfortunately. Drink too much, you probably get stabbed. Oh, and the big ones can definitely still kill you even if you're plastered. Yeah, they might just slap you to kingdom come with one of their many tree-sized tentacles. Maybe postpone the Irish vacation until all the beaches are cleared of eggs, eh? Hey, if you're liking this video so far, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. It really helps us with the algorithm. Let's keep it moving. Coming in at number four, we've got Becky and Harry from Creepshow. Can you hold your breath for a long time? Because if not, you'd better get to training. Because if you ever run into a ruthless rich man, or if you ever become one, you might find yourself neck deep in sand and watching the tide come in. This one comes from the short Something to Tide You Over. Of course, the millionaire himself, Richard Vickers, is only the beginning of this aquatic horror story. After finding out that his wife, Becky, has been unfaithful to him, Richard lures her lover, Harry, out to a secluded beach and buries him alive at gunpoint. Becky gets buried too, and they're all connected by CCTVs. Richard heads back up to his luxurious estate and watches the two panic as the tide inches closer and closer. But hey, if they can hold their breath long enough, they might be able to wriggle out once the water covers them and loosens the sand. Eesh. Well, they do find a way to get free, but not not as living, dry human beings. No, they come back as waterlogged, revenge-seeking seaweed people. Guns can't hurt them. Punches can't hurt them. They can't be stopped. And they stink of seawater and rotten fish. Becky and Harry, together forever, rotting and sloshing. Yuck. They do indeed get their revenge, too. They bury old Richard neck deep in sand, letting him experience the same fate they did. But remember, if he can hold his breath for a really long time, maybe he'll find a way out. Or maybe, just maybe, he'll end up waterlogged and revenge-fueled too. Such classic horror themes here, eh? You reap what you sow, you can't get away with everything. Coming in number three, we've got the creature from Leviathan. Widely underappreciated, Leviathan is a wonderful work of special effects mastery. The underwhelming plot might have something to do with its relatively small renown, but there are enough wicked scares and awesome creature moments to make up for that. The movie got a lot of flack when it was released for being really similar to Alien and The Thing, but who the hell considers that a bad thing? Moving on, let's talk about the creature itself. After an underwater mining crew comes across a scuttled Russian ship, Leviathan, things start to go sideways. After two of the crew succumb to extremely strange circumstances, it becomes apparent that the Russian crew from the Leviathan had some weird stuff done to them. Something about mutagens and tainted vodka, for sure, but soon enough, the underwater mining crew starts seeing these strange effects. Whatever was in that booze is now out and about assimilating crew members. You'd think liquor was safe, but this isn't grabbers. It starts small, but manages to remain terrifying and fascinating throughout every possible iteration. The transformation this creature goes through are incredible. Like, it's a shame more folks don't watch this movie just for the practical effects. There's a slimy lamprey version that eats its way inside a man and then becomes a terrible tentacle beast. It manages to spread even further, infecting more folks with even more eye-popping mutations. Eventually, we have a full-blown flesh and blood alien monster thrashing around in the underwater station. It even manages to pop up to the surface and attempt to drown the folks who escaped. They just don't make them like this anymore. Coming in at number two, we've got Dagon from Dagon. Ah, the classic monster from the deep. Originating from the Lovecraftian canon, Dagon is a deity who rules over the Deep One. The folks of Innsmouth worship him, people outside the town fear him, and of course he makes a terrifying appearance in a Stuart Gordon Lovecraft adaptation. I wish I never see.
Innsmouth is exchanged for Imboka though, and the esoteric order isn't named as such, but the terrifying nature of the beast remains. After falling on hard times, the villagers of Imboka are convinced to worship Dagon instead of God. This allows them to return to prosperity, but at the cost of blood sacrifices. Dagon demands human women to breed with, until all the regular humans die off, leaving only the half-human, half-sea creature abominations to populate the village. These creatures are horrid in their own special ways, with slimy fish heads and awful screeches galore. None of the lesser beings compare to the big bad himself though. While only making brief appearances in the movie, Dagon's presence is overwhelming. He permeates every aspect of the sleepy, creepy village as our protagonists discover more and more awful details. The sacrifices and rituals he demands are pretty filthy too. Skin flaying is just the beginning, but it's also shown in full gruesome detail. Lovecraftian creatures thrive on our own fears and being beyond comprehension. Dagon's effect on the humans that come into contact with him is scary in its own special way, even if we never really see the entire creature. And coming in at number one, we've got Cthulhu from Underwater. And speaking of Lovecraftian creatures, why not cap off the list with the legendary Great Dreamer himself? That's right, we are talking about one of the biggest, baddest creatures out there. Somehow awakened for a guest appearance at the end of this recent aquatic horror flick underwater, The Great Old One is truly magnificent. For most of the movie, the audience doesn't even know it's Cthulhu. It's a secret Lovecraft story, says director William Eubanks, and some folks don't quite pick up on that fact. But still, it's Cthulhu in all of his ghastly glory. An underwater drilling facility is badly damaged following a wicked earthquake at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. First of all, what are you doing down there? It's not worth it. Things only get worse from there, with strange creatures dragging folks into the murky depths on top of the inherent water pressure threat. The little beasts take all sorts of forms, from unrecognizable masses to vaguely humanoid shapes. But of course, the most terrifying monster of all is the enormous tentacled Great One, Cthulhu. He's the one who's been spawning all the smaller monsters, and he's pretty pissed that there are humans near his abode. Running into something so mind-bendingly horrible so deep underwater is a nightmare no matter how you look at it. And the worst part is, after everything happens, the mining and drilling efforts look like they're ready to expand. Who knows what they'll wake up next. Coming in at number 5, we've got SCP-5320. You know when an inside joke goes a little too far and starts to alienate the folks around you? Yeah, well that's kind of what went on with this SCP, except the inside joke had to do with a fish that never seems to end and the weird cult that it spawned. When your top researchers are essentially posting and creating pointless rituals instead of doing their job, somebody's got to step in. So even though this is a relatively harmless aquatic monster in and of itself, there are a lot of things that it could do to cause problems without ever leaving the comfort of the deep sea. As of right now, this creature is being described as an increasingly long snailfish, although no drones have ever been able to locate a head or tail. It's just all middle. The longer you look at it though, the worse things get. I'm talking about developing new obsessions and being more superstitious than ever. All because of an extra long fish, or as the folks associated with the church of the fish that just goes on forever like to call it, our merciful and long lord, or its glorious infinitude, hail its everlasting fish body. Additional side effects of viewing SCP-5320 include a heightened awareness of the passage of time, increased interest in ceiling tile number, and increased use of the phrase long boy in casual conversation even when referring to things that are neither long nor a boy. Personnel monitoring SCP-5320 have reported feeling an unusual amount of excitement upon seeing one of SCP-5320's occasionally visible fins, as well as a compulsion to loudly cheer. This odd behavior concerning those who were all for the fish raised some red flags with the higher ups at the foundation. They launched an investigation to see if anything info hazardous was actually going on and the results are inconclusive at best. It seems that all this can be explained away by saying folks tend to get involved with silly superstitions and inside jokes, especially when they're working on something boring for an extended period of time. But it could also be that the fish is info hazardous and drawing more people under its influence by convincing anyone who looks at it that it's all just goofery. I'd keep a close eye on anyone involved with the long lord himself, and even those only tangentially related to it. Coming in at number 4, we've got SCP-1836. Be careful while roaming the seas, you never know what you could run into. And hell, there are a lot of things out there that have been around a lot longer than us and probably have more claim to the stuff that lives in the ocean. We as modern humans often believe we can just do what we want with no consequences. This, as we're finding out quite quickly, is not necessarily the case. 
Take SCP-1836 for example, an enormous iceberg located in the Cunningham Inlet, colored green and containing all sorts of anomalies. The green color actually doesn't have any anomalous properties, it's just trapped algae. But the rest of the stuff I mentioned, you better watch out. So there are two parts to note here, a mass of long extinct tooth cetaceans and a humanoid figure that hangs out in an open living room style cavern within the iceberg. Basically a bunch of dinosaur style dolphin ancestors and a goddess with super long hair. If you get sensed by the creatures of SCP-1836 and you are hunting or fishing in the area, they're coming to get you. The iceberg will accelerate towards the creature being hunted and said creature will somehow know to head towards the iceberg. When they get close enough to each other, the iceberg will get between the hunter and the hunted. At this point, all of these cetaceans will emerge from the berg and attack the hunting vessel. If nothing was killed by the time the iceberg arrives, the ship will simply be sunk. However, if the hunters were successful in taking down some prey, these ancient creatures will not be so generous. They'll snag anyone on board and pull them underwater, bringing them to caverns in the underside of the iceberg. Nobody who has suffered this fate has ever been heard from again. There's a lot more lore to this one concerning gods, haircuts, and shamans, but I'll leave that to you to explore. For now, we'll leave it at a magical moving iceberg full of ancient creatures that will sink any ship that threatens local wildlife. I'd say that's a pretty sweet SCP. Coming in at number 3, we've got SCP-1569. Anyone here ever been punched by a shrimp? No? Well, thank your lucky stars because that is the last thing you want. Especially when it's a massive, weirdly modified peacock mantis shrimp meant exclusively for punching extremely hard. I'm sure you've heard of a peacock mantis shrimp before. They're famous for being able to absolutely annihilate stuff in front of them with extremely fast punches. If you put a regular one in an aquarium, there's a good chance that it will smash the glass by displacing water in such a way that it creates like a shock wave. But when you get one as large as 1569, you better believe it can cause a whole lot more damage. The big shrimp is 1 meter tall, 2 meters wide, and 9 meters long. And get this, its punch can strike with a force of up to 51,000 newtons. That would just vaporize someone. And imagine the shockwave. At first it appeared that this odd underwater entity had the intelligence of an average dog and was content to just hang out with people. Sure it would go and absolutely pulverize some underwater prey from time to time, but other than that it just seemed like an extra powerful version of a creature that already existed. However, one day something weird happened. The shrimp went dormant and opened up like a living mech and out popped the dude in competitive swimwear. And if I'm understanding the subsequent events correctly, this dude was essentially piloting this gigantic shrimp. Why? How? Was he the one acting like a dog? We may never know. But there is a special insignia on both the shrimp suit and the man inside, and it seems that there are some other strange connecting threads. Coming in at number two, we've got SCP-2770. No good deed goes unpunished, am I right? And this is especially true when you're out on the high seas and come across what appears to be a stranded man on an inflatable life raft. Most folks would head right over to help the poor castaway, right? But did any of them stop and think about why he might be out there in the first place? Oh boy. 2770 is a strange phenomenon where vessels spot what appear to be a poor unfortunate soul floating along on a yellow dinghy. It will appear and attempt to flag down manned vessels nearby, seemingly looking for rescue. If the vessel it targets does indeed come over to pick them up, it will initiate what's known as a boarding event. This is when an anomalous submarine will surface nearby and open its hatch. Once this hatch is open, it's game over. The rescuing vessel along with the dude in the raft will be pulled underwater at speeds upwards of 200 miles per hour, never to be seen again. Well, the castaway will appear again, but the other vessel? It's done. There doesn't seem to be a limit on the size of things that can get yanked underwater by this anomaly and it has been seen pulling truly enormous ships to their doom. One time the foundation even scooped the stranded man up in a helicopter and brought him back to HQ away from any large source of water. They thought they were so clever until they remembered the water table. The foundation site he was brought to is no longer in operation. And finally at number one we've got SCP-169, the Leviathan. There's nothing quite like this in the sea so you'd better watch out. Sailors and mariners have been talking about this creature for centuries. It's the stuff of legends. What else could inspire awe at such a level and survive for ages and ages? At this point, the foundation really has nothing they can do about it, so they just try and keep the legends, well, 
legendary. It measures somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 square kilometers and moves quite slowly under the water. Because it's so huge, there isn't really anything anyone can do about it. No structures can be built to contain it, and no weapons can be engineered to destroy it. Any satellite images of it shifting are to be destroyed. So sleep easy with the knowledge that it's been around longer than pretty much anything else on the surface of the planet and likely isn't going anywhere soon. Can't do anything about it, why worry? Number 5 on this list is the whale fish. This fish is like a legendary Pokemon when it comes to how rare it is. Live Science says the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute released footage in August showing a bright orange female whalefish around 6,600 feet deep offshore of Monterey Bay, California. Very little is known about this bizarre fish because of the three drastically different appearances of the juveniles, which are called tape tails, males, which are called big nose fish, and females, which are called whale fish. The three forms look so different that scientists originally thought that they were three different species. This shape shifting transformation from juvenile to mature females is believed to be one of the most extreme among vertebrates. Whalefish have rarely been seen alive in the deep, so many mysteries remain regarding these remarkable fish. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute tweeted, Let's pull up this image from the Smithsonian that really shows off exactly how weird this fish is. So here we have the three fish, and you can see exactly how different they all are. The Smithsonian says there are other examples of males and females with very different shapes and of animals changing from one shape to another as they grow older. But this is one of the most amazing examples of sexual dimorphism combined with metamorphosis ever found among vertebrates. So we are talking literally about a super rare shape shifting fish that in my opinion looks creepy as all holy hell. I'd say that you can find this beast at the bottom of the ocean but odds are you won't ever even run into it because of how rare it is. We've been exploring the bottom of our oceans for quite some time now and we are only just starting to learn a little bit about this fish. In all honesty, we really have no idea about it though. Whatever it is or whatever it does, one thing is pretty clear to me though. It's creepy looking, it lives at the bottom of the ocean, and I don't like it. Number 4 on this list is the Goblin Shark. This fish has got to be at the top of everyone's lists when it comes to the grossest looking creatures in the world. National Geographic says, Swishing through the deep sea, a goblin shark notices a small, yummy looking squid. The animal inches towards its prey. But as the fish closes in, the snack starts to dart away. So the shark thrusts its jaw three inches out of its mouth. The jaw is connected to three inch long flaps of skin that can unfold from its snout. The predator then grabs the squid in its teeth. After scarfing down the meal, the shark fits its jaw back into its mouth and swims off. That's right guys, a goblin shark's top and bottom teeth are attached to ligaments or bands of skin tissue tucked into its mouth. When prey is just out of reach, the shark extends the elastic tissue out of the mouth to nab the grub. This allows the animal to chow down on snacks such as teleost fish and squid. It also makes the shark one jaw-dropping fish. These disgusting looking creatures like to live right at the bottom of the ocean and are native to the oceans around Japan. There are also some of them off of South Africa and in the ocean water surrounding Portugal. They can grow to be 12 feet long and weigh almost 500 pounds. These aren't monsters, but they may as well be. A 500 pound beast with a detachable jaw that looks like a goblin just chilling at the deepest darkest part of the ocean. I truly cannot think of a whole lot of creatures I would rather run into than this freaking thing. Number 3 on this list is the proboscis worm. I don't care what anyone says, this has to be a monster. Just based on literally how freaking gross it is, it needs to be qualified as a monster. This species is also known as ribbon worms, and there are actually a ton of ribbon worms in the world. The ones I'm talking about reside deep at the bottom of the ocean. 
These ones usually grow to be bigger than the other ones in the world. The Smithsonian Magazine says the largest species of ribbon worm is the bootlace worm, which can be found writhing among rocks in the waters of the North Sea. Not only is it the largest Nemertian, but it may also be the longest animal on the planet. Uncertainty remains because these stretchy worms are difficult to accurately measure, but they have been found at lengths of over 30 meters and are believed to even grow as long as 60 meters longer than the blue whale. Despite their length, they are less than an inch around. Now these creatures don't have any natural predators and let me tell you why. Because they look disgusting. Like, let me ask you guys, would you want to eat that? I would straight up need to be starving and there would literally need to be nothing edible left on the planet other than this thing before I decide to take a bite. It literally looks like a large intestine that just slithers across the bottom of the ocean. Shockingly enough, this is a real thing though and you can find it chilling in deep waters. Number two on this list is zombie worms. We aren't quite done with the worm talk yet guys because now we have got to look at zombie worms. Zombies are a pretty terrifying monster, so are these just like them? The Smithsonian says zombie worms don't crave brains, instead they seek bones. The 1 to 3 inch Ostax worms were first discovered in the bones of a rotting gray whale on the deep sea floor nearly 10,000 feet deep in 2002. Since then, more Osidex species have been discovered. There are 26 according to the World Register of Marine Species. Zombie worms don't eat mineral bones directly, instead they digest fats within the bone. However, their style of eating is quite different from ours because they don't have a mouth or a stomach. They secrete an acid from their skin that dissolves bone, freeing up the fat and protein trapped inside. Then, symbiotic bacteria living in the worm's body digests the fat and protein. How Osidax acquire nutrients from the bacteria isn't known. They may simply digest the bacteria or nutrients are somehow transferred to the worm. They hold on to whatever bones they can find by drilling in with roots which contain the symbiotic bacteria. Zombie worms can retract these plumes into the body when they are disturbed. If all this isn't strange enough, the only worms doing any drilling are female. The microscopic males live inside their bodies. One study counted 111 males inside just one female zombie worm. This eliminates the pesky step of having to search for a mate because the eggs and sperm are right next to each other. Then the worms can disperse many fertilized eggs far and wide, hoping that they land near some recently fallen bones. Needless to say, but these are some weird freaking creatures. No wonder we've nicknamed them zombie worms. They're about as monstrous as you could possibly get. Not to mention, but they feast on the bodies and bones of the dead, similarly to what zombies would want to be doing. Number one on this list is the Sloan's Viperfish. As with most things on this list, we have a thoroughly disgusting looking creature. This thing is just as dangerous as it is disgusting though. The Twilight Zone says, like many of the inhabitants of the deep sea, Sloan's viperfish sport light producing organs called photophores along its body. These flashing blue, green, or yellow lights might attract tasty snacks, but they're most useful for masking the fish's silhouette from predators below. They're also useful for grabbing a meal. When prey comes near, the viper fish drops a glowing light on its dorsal fin ray like a fishing lure in front of its mouth and snap. A muscular jaw filled with clear, sharp teeth comes crashing down like a guillotine. Lucky for the viper fish, its first vertebrae has evolved to act as a shock absorber for that powerful bite. This is the deep sea version of a piranha, except way more deadly. If you were getting attacked by piranhas, there would likely need to be multiple of them to attack you to actually win. I could totally see a world though where you lose one on one versus this thing though. Its teeth would literally dig so deep in your body. Even at the thickest part of your body, this thing has the potential to go all the way through if it bites you well enough. Thank goodness it's swimming thousands of meters below us and we don't need to worry about it popping up on our next snorkeling adventure. 